Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee and this is the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts in the shadow of the great Blue Hills. I'm so excited that you're part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids family. Our guest today is the author of Five Sisters. This is a wonderful interview. I can't wait for you to meet our guest today, Stephanie Campisi. Before we invite Stephanie in, I want to encourage you to go to solveitforkids.com. Sign up for our newsletter. You know, respond to the sneak previews of Solve It For Kids here on the Reading With Your Kids podcast has been so enthusiastic. We are spinning this show off on its own. It's going to become its own podcast that you'll be able to find on Apple and Google and wherever you find your podcast. But the thing you should do is to go over to solveitforkids.com. That way you can sign up for our newsletter. You'll be the first to know whatever's coming down the pike. And your kids will also be encouraged to become a Solve for Kids team member and be eligible for all sorts of prizes and have us give them a shout out on the show. I'm really excited. Everybody loves Solve It For Kids. You will too. Please go today. SolveItForKids.com Joining us right now from hot and sunny California. She is the author of a great new book from our friends at Familius called Five Sisters. Please welcome to the show, Stephanie Campisi. Stephanie, welcome. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Jedley. Thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to have you here, and it's great to hear that California accent. <laughs> That's right, the nice drawl. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we'll get into how you ended up in California in a bit, but first tell us all about Five Sisters, please. Absolutely. So Five Sisters is my fourth book. It's coming out from Familius on the 26th of May, so it's almost there. Uh, it's a folktale inspired story about an old couple who lives in the woods and longs for nothing more than a daughter and they turn to magic to make it happen. Um, it features gorgeous illustrations by Madalena Andronic, who's a Romanian illustrator based in Italy and they're out of this world. First off, I, I, I have to tell you, um, I was speaking to Stephanie before the show. I let her know, uh, about an experience my daughter and I had. My daughter's in the music business. You would have automatically endeared yourself to my daughter because she loves it when an artist comes out and everybody's cheering for that artist and, and the artist always takes time to introduce the members of the band and acknowledge the crew. And the, right out of the gate, you acknowledged your illustrator. So hats off to you. Great job. It's so important to acknowledge all the folks who help us make our, our dreams come true. Absolutely. I think that's particularly true of picture book authors. You know, I'm only half the creator. The illustrator brings a story to life. It's a collaboration. Not to mention the editor, the art director, the publicist, the marketer. It's a whole team. I think it's really easy to think of an author just sitting at their computer typing away, but really there's a whole team behind them making everything happen. You know, that's a really, really great point. And, you know, one of the things that we love to do here, because we do have a lot of authors who listen to the show, I think it's really important for for authors and also readers to understand that there's there is a team even even when an author is is self publishing there's still a team around that person helping to pull their art together and um, I, I you know there are lots of people out there who and lots of kids out there who who love to read they love books. They don't feel like they're a writer. They don't see themselves sitting down and doing doing the writing, but they can still be part of that creative process by supporting an artist or an or author or an illustrator. Absolutely. I think there's an opportunity for everyone to be creative these days. I think it's at our fingertips, whether you're just putting a post up on Instagram, taking a photo, writing a tweet, there's that opportunity to create. And I think... You know, even if you're not a writer or an illustrator, it's so easy to get in touch with creatives at the moment. So it's really easy to be part of that process, which is really exciting. Yeah. What inspired you to create Five Sisters? Oh, this one has a really kind of interesting origin story. So David Miles, who used to be the art director of Familius, emailed me and said, 
I'd love to see a story about Matryoshka dolls. And I thought, okay. And then I sat on that for a little while, just that germ, that germ of an idea. And at the same time, my husband and I were looking at having a baby and all of our friends were sort of going through the same thing. Um, so that was in our minds as well. Um, so I had these kind of two parallel tracks of creating this story going on in my head, this idea of this obviously Russian inspired, inspired folk tale with elements like the fox, the wolf, the couple in the woods, all of those elements. But this parallel track of the challenge of having a baby and that kind of fed into the, what ended up being the narrative of this story, which was this couple that wanted to have a baby but weren't able to. Um, and what they go through in order to have this magical child in the end. And I just thought it was really interesting that, you know, myself and my husband, you know, we had, it was a journey. Um, and for many of my friends, it was a journey as well. And it's something that people don't actually speak about. Um, and I think that difficulty, that challenge, that, that protracted journey towards really creating your family and what families are willing to do to build that family, create that family. Um, that ended up being the narrative thread of the story, obviously as metaphor and allegory, but it really fed into the Five Sisters narrative where we have this old couple who all they long for is a daughter. In the, mean, in the meantime, they're tending to the forest around them, they're tending to the forest creatures, and then the forest sort of gives back to them mm-hmm. in a magical way that allows them to create this family. I won't spoil the ending since the book isn't out yet. <laughs> but, yeah, it was this parallel thread um, of that folkloric, um, approach and a little bit of a personal narrative there as well. That's I, I love I, I I love that you're talking about creating a family and making the choice to create a family and acknowledging that it's 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 a, a, a struggle and and a journey and and that it's challenging. Mm-hmm. I I think. I think sometimes, you know, we kind of celebrate birth and we celebrate family so much uh, and, and and we always put the ribbons and the balloons and the flowers on it and so people kind of get the feeling that when they're struggling with it, I can't let anybody else know that I'm having a hard time here because everybody else is, it's a party for everybody else, but it's it's tough for us. I think it's important for us to be able to share that, hey, this is this is a lot of work especially now. Absolutely. And I think that was something that I, I'd never really touched upon. Um, my friends were keeping it all quiet as well. Um, I think I've, I've hit that age where all of my friends are establishing their careers, so it's baby time. Yeah. Um, but just having a baby, it's not something you can just put in your planner and make happen. <laughs> and, and so there are different paths that people take, and, you know, adoption is an option, natural birth. Is, there are so many different paths to get there, and people do go through all sorts of personal challenges, interpersonal challenges, and it wasn't until I sort of started being honest with my friends and family about what we were going through that suddenly I started hearing all of these other stories about what other couples were going through, and I realized this is actually normal. <laughs> it's not what you see on television or what you read in books or magazines or so on where everything just goes the way it's meant to. I mean, maybe it's not meant to go that way. I think, yeah, it is a journey, and it's, it was actually re- it really helped to hear that other people were going through the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, I know one of the things that, that we did with, with our kids is as they were getting older and learning, we kind of shared with them some of those struggles and some of that journey, not to make them feel bad at all, but just to let them know that you, we wanted you so much. That this is what we're willing to, to go through. You know, we we're willing to climb the mountain both ways in the snow, 20 miles and, you know, and because you were so worth it to us. You were so important to us. It didn't matter that, you know, time, money was tight sometimes and we didn't get to sleep and it was, you know, I, 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 I love that you, that, that you talk about that. I, because I think it's important and I think like you found, being open and being honest about that, suddenly um, you you found out that you weren't alone and probably felt more supportive at that at that moment. Absolutely, and I hope that the people around me were as well, knowing that they weren't alone going through it. So hopefully, it had a nice flow and effect that benefited everyone. Yeah. But exactly what you said, like I say to my son, because we have a nine month old now, yay. <laughs> so, you know, I say to him every day, "You are so wanted. You are so loved." And I feel like that that idea of just 
wanting that person so much in your life comes through in the five sisters where they do manage to get the child of their dreams eventually but the effort that they went to individually as an and a couple to get there um it, it was pretty profound and pretty protracted and they gave up a lot to get there mm-hmm. i love too that the story was created by a seed that was planted in your in your mind uh the david who's a a genius you know, just kind of came along and, and talked about that. It's the nesting dolls. You used a different term um, that I don't want to mis- mispronounce. But just by planting, I'd like a story about this. Um, sometimes that can really yield, uh, like, a- a- amazing fruits. Absolutely. I think even just a little prompt like that, I think any creative will take in a completely different direction. I think if he'd given that story idea to somebody else, they would have done something completely different with it, which I think is what's so exciting about the creative process. And I think sometimes it needs to germinate as well. I feel like you can have that that seed or germ of an idea, and it's when it collides with something else that it starts turning into a story. I think once you have those two elements that come together, you start to have a story. So he started that. He was that spark, I think. And then everything else that was happening, that's what turned it into a story. Yeah. Yeah. Now, were you conscious of the fact that you had these two parallel things going on? You had this prompt of a story idea. You had your own struggle. Were you aware that you were kind of, you know, pollinate, the, the, the both were pollinating each other? A little bit at the time, much more so retrospectively. Um, and I think – working through the edits as well. That's when it really became clear to me. Um, So the editing process probably took about, I think it took about a year. We went back and forth quite a lot of times. Michelle Robbins is a wonderful editor. She took me back and forth through the story. We refined it. um, We refined the idea, narrowed it down, really focused in on what the story was trying to say um, and what the themes of it were. And as we were doing that, I think everything that was going on in my life was becoming much more crystallized. I mean, I was pregnant at the time. (laughs) So it was becoming much more crystallized, I think. And I think often it's once you start to have a little bit of that creative distance that you realize what you're putting into a story, even though you might have been doing it subconsciously before. Uh-huh. Uh, was it was it a case where it, it, it occurred to you or did your editor turn to you and go, dude, this is like your story here? <laughs> I think she's much too polite to say that. <laughs> I think I think it was me in that case, but I'm sure she might have thought it. <laughs> Uh, such such a great. I, I just love hearing how stories come together, and it, it's it's really exciting. Um, I, we I early, alluded to earlier the your your lovely Californian accent. How did you? Uh, you and and I was joking, of course. How did you uh, arrive in in California? Well, so I um, actually arrived in the U.S. I'm an Australian originally from Melbourne, um, best city in the world, most livable city in the world. Um, I think second to Vancouver, Canada now, but oh well. Um, I actually won a green card, which is a thing. Um, moved early 2014 after a little bit of traveling around the U.S. and sort of picking a spot that I like the sound of and lived there for a couple of years. Uh, actually met my husband, moved to Washington uh, lovely rain in Washington, and then after a few years, I said, "I'm done with the rain." So we moved to the desert <laughs> in September of last year. Um, I think he's done with the heat, so we might need to find a compromise in the middle. Maybe Northern California <laughs> might be the way to go next time. Yeah, I was going to say there really is, a, you know, you you can get London and the outback, but there's there's middle that you know you know. <laughs> We're not very good at that, are we? It's, we seem to be people of extremes. <laughs> oh, well, it keeps life interesting. It is. And, and you know, you, you alluded uh, when you're talking about winning a green card, and you said that that is a thing. That That, that is a thing. Can you take it? Because a lot of people might not be aware that that is a thing. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. I'm not even sure if the program is still active at the moment. It might not be. Um, but it, um, so moving over here is actually really difficult unless you already have a job or you're married to an American or you are American by background in terms of, you know, your family. Um, and then one of the other options is to enter your name and details into a website that looked like it was built in the 1990s and hit enter. <laughs> and, and so I did that. Uh, I received a letter from from the U.S. I guess government telling me to go to the consulate in Sydney and apply for an interview, and then move to the U.S. And within the next six months. And I thought, oh, okay, this is happening. <laughs> so 
I just uprooted my entire life and moved over. Why not? Uh, <laughs> I, I can't argue with that. That's wonderful. Because you can't pass up. I think it's yeah. a pretty good opportunity. So. <laughs> I, I, I was aware. I was aware of that because we we host international kids and and a couple of kids. And I felt really bad for them because they were here, and they had spent twelve years going to mm-hmm. high school and undergrad and graduate school here, and so they actually lived more here than in their home country uh and then it was like i didn't get it and i have to go back um so i was aware of that and i think it's important for folks to be aware of you know if you live in a country you should be aware of how of, of how people come in and and the opportunities that people have to come in absolutely it's so difficult and and so my visa was literally a lottery um it's just picked from there are various regions around the world it's the idea is to increase diversity um in immigration around the world so different regions are represented i'm from the oceania region it's australia new zealand and the surrounding islands um and so obviously there's not much immigration from there so that's how i was drawn it was just literally the luck of the draw and i had to do some background checks and that kind of thing but the luck of the draw but there, the channels are so difficult otherwise, and I think it's true of any country's immigration. I mean, I had a friend from South Korea who, who had the same situation. She went through high school, went through university, then was sponsored on by her employer, then her contract ended, and she had to go back home even though she'd grown up here. So it's very challenging for a lot of people, and it's the, the channels are difficult and time-consuming and expensive to work your way through. Absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned that this is your second book with our friends at Familias. Can you tell us about your other? Yes. So my first one is Lewis and Tabitha um, with Holly Mengett, who's a wonderful illustrator based in Seattle. Actually, no, now she's based in California as well. She escaped the rain too. She also illustrated Unicorn and Horse, which is another Familias book. Um, so Lewis and Tabitha is a bit like the lady in the tramp, but with cats. So it's a, a love story between an alley cat and an indoor cat and how their love comes to be. Um, Highly recommend it. <laughs> the illustrations have this beautiful sort of 1950s retro vibe. It feels very like, Disney-esque. It's gorgeous. Um, and that's recently been turned into a book, which is an animated, wo- uh, animated book um, by a company out of uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, highly recommended. And I have another one forthcoming from Familius next year called Quacks Like a Duck, which is about a platypus who shows up at a fancy dress party and everybody thinks she's a duck. <laughs> So that one is very much about my experiences in Australia and in America. <laughs> Feeling very out of place and showing up with Australian desserts that nobody understands. I, you know, I, I, I'm just sitting here thinking, and you're talking about telling your, your, your ni- nine-month-old, oh, you are love. We wanted you so much. We went through so much to bring you into our lives. I can't wait until that nine-month-old is old enough to start appreciating some of the imaginative stories that you'll be sharing uh, in the in the future. Uh, I mean, it's just awesome, uh, it, you know. And and I imagine that there are going to be a lot of story ideas that that you're just kind of riffing and talking to your child, and all of a sudden it's like, well, this is a good story. I hope I remember this so I can write about it. That's absolutely true. I mean, at this point, he's interested in chewing on my books, which I think is a very good start. <laughs> but I have noticed, though, my current picture books are definitely targeted at an older audience, but working with such a young baby and watching what he reacts to, how he engages with the world, I have so many little ideas that are for him rather than, I think, for me as, a, as who I was as a child. Um, so I have a little document that I keep on my computer, and I have it on my phone as well. And every time I get a story idea, I just type it in there, a few little words, because that's all I can manage between him and my day job. <laughs> so I just have this document of all of these great little ideas that I think he will love and appreciate. So he's definitely changed my approach to storytelling, and I think given me all these ideas that you don't necessarily see as an adult. I think kids see the world in such an interesting way with such fresh eyes, and particularly a baby, everything is fascinating, particularly kitchen gadgets. Um, (laughs) So there are all these ideas that might not have struck me as an adult that I see, I guess, through filtered through his eyes now. That's maybe more creative and interesting way. You know, I have, I have a friend who's a photographer, and, and he created a, a a series of photographs when his child was an infant. And what he did is he got down on the floor, and he looked at the world from his child's perspective. And it was really fascinating. And I think, 
I think that that's a great exercise for everybody to do is to just kind of take, get out of your own head mm-hmm. and try to look at the world through, through the eyes of an infant and, and, you know, on, in, on, on, in the same token, look at the world through the eyes of different people. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It helps you be more empathetic. <laughs> and, you know, um, I think it makes the world a better place. Absolutely. I completely agree. I think there are so many opportunities to do that when you have kids and to show them that empathy as well. They're just little vessels waiting to be filled with ideas and um, philosophies and so on and experiences. And if you can guide them in a way, a meaningful way, I think that's really important. Uh, and I love that your child is already devouring books. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> the books don't think the same. Uh, there are a few <laughs> teeth marks and drool marks on them, but they're, they're definitely well loved. <laughs> you know, I, I, again, I'm impressed. Every time you mention one of your books, you mention the illustrator. I, it, it seems like you have a really tight bond or a, you have a huge respect for the illustrators. Uh, are you able to work as as you're writing uh, with the illustrators or is it a situation where you create the story and then you hand it off and you just get this nice surprise when the book arrives? That is a wonderful question. So it depends. Mm-hmm. Um, some, so there are some author and illustrator teams that work collaboratively throughout the whole process. Um, some very established authors will often work with a preferred illustrator as well when they're creating. They're creating. At my stage, I guess, and with the publishers that I've worked with, I typically send off the manuscript. I might have some ideas of what an illustration for a particular page might look at, particularly might look like, particularly if there's a special reveal that's not shown in the text and so on. So I might put some illustration notes in there, but I've been assigned illustrators and I cross my fingers and hope for the best. And I have been pleasantly surprised every single time. I feel like the, the publisher is also the art director. So they have a vision for the story that I think is far, far better than my own as <laughs> a lowly writer. Um, and so they, they're able to pair the story with, you know, somebody out of their portfolio of illustrators and they pick the perfect person to express that story. And the illustrator, they will do their thing. There might be a little bit of back and forth, like I might see sketches and so on and maybe make a few adjustments, but really it's a collaboration between the illustrator using my text and the art director and the publisher and the editor and so on because pictures are edited too. Um, and then typically at the end, um, I will see the illustrations then and I might give it a little bit of feedback just making sure that it conforms to the plot or certain things in the story, but that's it. So, yeah, I do. I get a lovely surprise. Um, I've been very happily surprised every time. It's great. It's like Christmas all year round. <laughs> Was it difficult for you taking your story, your baby, your creation, and handing it off and saying, okay, I'm going to trust you to take this and change it? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think writing is such a collaborative thing that, I mean, it can be difficult to get feedback sometimes. Um, you usually take the feedback, walk away for a little bit, and then realize that whoever is giving you the feedback is so much smarter than you are, and then go, oh, I completely understand that suggestion. <laughs> so it can be hard initially. Um, I think it, it is such a personal thing that it's very difficult to be to send off this piece of you and know that it's going to come back with sentences crossed out and things rewritten and new ending and so on. Um, but editors are very collaborative. They're not going to go through and just slash apart your story and then put it in a book and you have no say. Often they'll come to you and say, we don't think this part is working. What are you trying to say here? How can you express this in a better way? Can we can we reduce this so that it's not as lengthy? Can we add a little bit more oomph to the story and so on? And they'll ask you questions to make you come up with a better way um, of you know fixing the story or communicating the story. So it's very collaborative. Um, very pleasant. I've never had an editor say anything mean or make me cry or anything. Um, but it is difficult because it, you know, it's a per- stories are personal, and I think it's probably the same with illustrators as well. Like your art is personal, um, but you, you get used to it. I think I work as a copywriter in my day job, so I'm used to a lot of feedback. <laughs> well, I, I think that's great advice that you, that you gave. That when you get the feedback, take a step back. And, and not react to it right away. Take a walk. Let, let it sit there. Let it germinate. Let it kind of, okay. And, and you, that way it's, you're not reacting to it and you're better able to, to hear it. 
Absolutely. I think it's very easy when you get that edit letter, you only see the bad things. You say, oh, I'm a terrible writer. I can't put a sentence together. I have no idea how to plot a story. Those are the things you see. But when you actually read the letter and you think about it in the context of this person bought my book and championed it because they love it, so they see something here, their job is to try to bring up the most that story can be. They're trying to improve the story so that the reader has the best experience that they can, and that's what they're trying to do. They're not telling me that I'm a terrible creative. Sometimes I might be, but <laughs> they're not telling me that. Their, their job is to improve the story, and I think that's true of any any well-done critical feedback. So it's not personal. They're just trying to help you put your best self out there. Awesome. Thank goodness for editors. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, thank, thank goodness that we live in an age where we not only can hear an author tell about their beautiful books, but we can also connect with them online and find out more about them and find out about the other books that they've created or are working on. So where can folks connect with you online? Absolutely. So I have a website at www.stephaniecampisi.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at, at Steph Campisi and Instagram at the same, although I'm not very good at taking photos, so maybe don't go there. Um, and that's where you'll find me mostly. We've had a wonderful time speaking with the author of Five Sisters, a brand new book from our friends at Familia, Stephanie Campisi. Stephanie, thanks so much for being on the show. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the time. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Catherine Factor. She'll be here to tell us about Houdini, Choose Your Own Adventure, Spies. This is a really, really cool series. It's a book that has multiple endings, twists and turns. You can read, I, I, I think she said you can read the book like 30 or 40 different ways. You know, there are all these choices you can make along the way. And we get to talk about one of my favorite uh, people in magic, Houdini. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. If you're the author of a great children's book, we would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Being a guest gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic children's book. Please be sure to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the contact button that you find at the bottom of the page. Let us know about your great book. We'll let you know the next easy steps. And it is very, very easy. It's a lot of fun. And like I said, it gives you the chance to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so very, very wonderful. Of course, we want to thank our guest, Stephanie Campisi. I also want to thank all of our friends over at Familia, especially my buddy Kate. I want to thank the incredible team that helps me put together this show, starting with my amazing producer, Fatima Khan, my awesome author, Ambassador Peggy Cotto. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank the one and only Augie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. But most of all, I want to thank you. You are doing so much. You're, you're teaching your kids. You're feeding your kids. You're, 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 you're keeping them safe. And most of all, you're reading to your kids. And all of that work, even though it seems so overwhelming, you're doing a fantastic job at it. And please hear me when I say that you are making the world a better place. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. <laughs>